Hello boys and girls, welcome to Punishing Dumbass Openings. I think this is episode number nine now. Now this isn't a game that I played, this has been sent in by a chess.com friend, Thin White Duke, big up the Bowie fans. Um, and it's an interesting one. Okay, uh, let's switch over to, this is, this is the game, and um, the opponent, so both rated in the 800 to 900 range. And uh, it has to be said, like uh, Thin White Duke 85 commented, how does somebody get to 800 playing this way? But let's have a look. Okay, so we'll, we'll go over the, the game. It's not terribly long. Um, and uh, the play with the white pieces starts with G3. Okay, now this is not as this is not a dumbass opening in itself, right? In fact, we'll just switch over to the Explorer now. I've got it set to Master Games. You can see that G3, the King's Fianchetto opening, is actually the fifth most common opening for white. Having said that, E4 with 1.3 million and D4 with over a million, and then Knight to F3 and C4 have half a million between them. So you've got two and a half million openings in the top four. So C4 being the English and Knight to F3 being the Reti, but that's kind of interchangeable with, with G3, I guess, as well. So, but here's how it normally goes. If you, if you click through G3 and the most common next few moves, this is what you get, right? D5 from black, um, Knight comes out, Knight comes out, Fianchetto the bishop, we have the King's Indian attack, right? C6 and then castles, okay? This is the King's Indian attack. It's absolutely kosher for white, right? Now let's see what happens in the game itself. So white opens with g3, nothing wrong there. And now we have e5. So we saw that with the masters, um, d5 was the most common response. And I guess the, the idea is that you know that your opponent, they've just signaled um, that they're going to Fianchetto the bishop on there. So the bishop is going to have influence on this long light square diagonal. Therefore, it kind of makes sense to play d5, c6, like we just saw in the in the master's database, okay? But there you go, you live and learn. Um, and now they Fianchetto the bishop. I would say this is maybe slightly premature. As we saw before, bringing the knight out is um, more common than that. This bishop is, yeah, I mean, it's potentially exerting some influence, but it's not really controlling the center too much. It's controlling those two squares. Um, but I think, I think you know, bringing your knights out early makes, makes a bunch of sense, okay? So black responds by bringing their knight out, and you can see now what white is doing. They're going for the, the double Fianchetto option. Black develops a bishop. This makes sense, preparing to castle kingside. Um, the bishop's also looking down at the f2 square. It's all good. Um, white pushes a pawn. Okay. Develops a knight. And now h4. h4 is a weird um, move to play at this point. It's really not very necessary. You know, if it's like, is white planning to castle kingside? If they are, why play h4? Okay. It's... It's... Well, removing some defense from this g3 square, but it's it's attacking or controlling then g5, but no one's going to g5. It, it just seems like a, a bit of a, a goofy um, way to proceed. Okay, so we have d6 and black, and now the knight comes out. Black now plays h5, preventing the knight from, from going to that square. Um, and white then proceeds to... Um, develop their other bishop. So you might argue that white does have some kind of central control here through the bishop and this knight, but this I think is the most noticeable um, issue with this approach is that um, they, they really haven't competed for the center. The only central pawn that they've moved is e3, okay? Whereas black has moved the d pawn and the e pawn and is controlling a lot of squares within white's territory, which is the definition of space. Black has this space advantage. Um, and at this point now, it, it starts to fall apart. So we'll look at this, look at this knight in particular, okay? And there's a couple of things you have to notice, right? 
First of all, knights in line with the queen. And secondly, look out for that pawn. All right. So think out to the bishop. Bishop comes down to g4, pinning the knight. Okay. Now, what I would do in this situation is consider moving the queen out of the way. Simply break the pin. Okay. Because e5 is threatened now. And that simply wins the knight. The knight can't move or else, or else the queen will be captured. Okay. Um, white in this instance did not notice and decided to push a4 so and apparently they this is the opening they always play as white um, I don't I don't think it's very good I mean this knight can still come in cause trouble uh, black has a, a definitely a superior position here and now you know black knows what they're doing attack the pinned piece right classic tactic this piece is pinned against the queen, very high value piece, just attack the pinned piece, and for some reason now white decides to move the knight out of the way and uh, save the knight, or almost save the knight, but give up the queen. The king recaptures and then white simply uh, resigns the position. So, yeah, I mean, when I saw this game, I thought, you know, you can kind of see what the idea is. It's double fianchetto, but also this double kind of crab formation. I think it might even be called the crab opening. Um, by pushing these pawns up, but I don't really don't feel like these pawns are controlling squares of great significance. Um, and also, you know, white has failed to castle the king, um, hasn't completed development, 10 moves in, and I think just simply too many pawn moves. These, these moves on the edge, I don't see any real value for them. So, yeah, borderline dumbass openings, but... Um, I mean, I, I, this is not an opening that, that I see very often on chess.com. Um, maybe he's had some success with this at some point, but I think that the the main problem with this opening is, it, is it's slow, right? He's making these pawn moves okay. I mean, these make sense. If you want to fianchetto your bishops, fianchetto bishops can be very powerful. It's a perfectly valid approach to the game, okay? But h4 and a4, I think, were just wasted moves. They were just thrown away. And, of course, it led, you know, to... Uh, Black here has a, a um, an advantage in development already because of this, this pawn move that's been played. And, and also this one, which was arguably unnecessary. But, yeah, again, I, th there's a reason why people say compete for the centre in the opening. Um... And, you know, with the, the King's Indian attack, you do that to a degree, but then you definitely want to be pushing pawns forward to exert, grab some space on the board. But here, white just doesn't do it. You know, it's just really, space doesn't seem to be an issue. And they're, they're like, pushing pawns forward up the sides of the board. But that's not the action area. This is where you want to be focusing your attention. This is These are the most valuable uh, real estate on the board. Okay, so use your pawns to control these, and white just doesn't do that. So I uh, deserve to lose. Um, in, tr in true dumbass style, uh, even here, you know, d5 is playable. I don't know. Not a good one. Not a good one. But uh, I hope that's some you know, um, use for you, if you're particularly if you're, if you're sub 1000 as well. Um, I don't like to see it when, when beginner players kind of adopt an opening or system and then simply just roll it out for the first dozen moves every single time. That is that is not the way to improve at chess. You Yes, you may win some games going down that route, but you'll have to rely on your own tactics later on. But slavishly, slavishly following a fixed kind of opening progression particularly when it's weak and this has inherent weaknesses you know these edge pawns moving up totally unnecessary um so i i think this guy's going to find himself hitting a wall at some point because if he if, as long as he sticks to this opening um yeah i i think opponents who are more responsive and nimble on their toes will be able to take this apart fairly easily so there's a lesson there you know, if you're a beginner, um, I, I really would recommend 
learning your opening principles, okay, which is you've got to move two pawns. You've got to move a light pawn and a dark pawn in order to release your bishops. Get your knights out probably first in preference to bishops. Um, get your queen off the back rank. Get all your minor pieces developed into the board so you can control some space. Castle your king, very, very important. Um, and then you go into the middle game and then you think about building up to an attack, right? Um, at the same time, when there are tactical opportunities or threats, you must respond to those in a sober and intelligent way. Here, um, I mean, this move, he just didn't spot the this double threat from the dark squared bishop and the e-pawn together on the knight. I think he was just too blinkered looking at his own side of the board, thinking that he was knocking out his own development. And he's almost lost the game, and he's used 22 seconds of a 30-minute rapid game. Okay, If you're going to play like that, play bloody bullet. Play three-minute blitz. If you're going to knock out your moves, and you're opening in 20 seconds. Okay, and here the game finishes, and he's used a grand total of 34 seconds on his clock. Right? Just giving free rating points away today. It's a, it's a gift day. Wonderful stuff. Anyway, so yeah, hope that's useful for you. Hope you picked up one or two things. Um, thanks for supporting Chess Bootcamp, and I will see you soon.